perfect. And today with us, we have Dr. Dean Grubbs, who um, is a fish ecologist with interest in the biology of exploited and poorly studied estuarine and marine taxa. So what that means is just, um, there's over 500 different species of sharks. And yes, people talk about white sharks and hammerheads and tiger sharks, but there are a lot of diverse species, particularly in the deep sea, that sometimes scientists have only ever seen one of. We know very little. So how do you study an animal that lives um, thousands of feet below the surface? Uh, so today, uh, Dr. Grubbs is gonna talk about that. That. He is the Associate Director of Research at Florida State University's Coastal and Marine Lab. Um, you may have seen him on many different documentaries um, from Shark Week, Animal Planet, BBC, talking about his research, anything from deep sea to sawfish um, and lots of species in between. So um, for everyone watching as well, if you can put your questions in the, we've, we do not have the chat bar going. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A section. Um, we're going to let Dr. Grubbs get started here. Uh, when he finishes, we'll go through and do as many of the questions as we can, um, but we are limited a little bit on time. So if you have a question and we're not able to answer it, please just um, send a message to us. You can check out our social pages or send us an email. We'll do our very best to try and answer as many as we can. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. I'm going to disappear for a minute and uh, yeah, enjoy guys. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. So uh, thanks Jillian for that introduction and thank you all for, uh, for joining, joining me for this. I know I've got quite a few uh, friends around, around the states that are tuning in and I'm a buddy Theo and Crawfordville's watching and uh, I think uh, Miss Sparling's class up in Georgia's watching, may even have uh, Jasper and Ruby up in uh, New York watching. So as Jillian mentioned, I'm gonna, uh, uh, tell you guys a little bit about sharks of the twilight zone, so sharks of the deep sea. Uh, so just to give you a heads up where I am sitting right now, that little red star there is where the FSU Coastal Marine Lab is located. And so uh, my research is based mostly out of this marine lab. Uh, we do a lot of coastal shark work along the coast of Florida primarily, but elsewhere. We do a lot of sawfish research down in the Florida Keys and the Bahamas, as Jillian mentioned. And then we also do a lot of deep hey, sea. Hey. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to interrupt. We're not seeing your screen. All right, hold on. I, I hit, I hit share screen. Oh, it's got, it I, I see, I got, yeah. yeah. How's that? You're good. And then once you just hit, yes, play from perfect, you're good. All right, now we're good. Sorry. No problem. Okay. So there's the, uh, there's the little red star I mentioned. So that's uh, where I'm located. And so our work is on coastal sharks along the, shark, the uh, coast of Florida, uh, sawfish down in the Bahamas and, and the Florida Keys, and then also deep sea work, which is, we've done deep sea work around the world, but most of it's either in the Gulf of Mexico up along the east coast of the US. And we've also done a bit of deep sea work in the, uh, in the Bahamas. So, Jillian sort of answered this question already. When I ask people how many different kinds or how many species of sharks there are, um, you get various numbers from, from people. Uh, and if you ask folks to name some sharks, the ones they name are the ones that Jillian just mentioned, things like white sharks and bull sharks, whale sharks, tiger sharks, hammerheads, things like, th things like that. Um, but in reality, there are, there are about 540 living species of sharks in the world. Uh, and most of them don't look anything like those uh, that we just mentioned. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, this may seem like a lot of species, 540 species. And if you add those together with their close relative, the batoids, the rays and skates and things like that, and the chimeras, uh, you come up with about 1,250 species, something like that. But if you look at the overall diversity of animals with backbones on the planet, there's about 72,000 species and only 1,200 species of sharks and their relatives. So it's a pretty small group now. Um, if you went back in the Carboniferous era, about 360 million years ago, you would see that sharks dominated this group. But now they're a pretty small uh, remaining group in this, this, uh, that's with us now. Uh, by way of comparison, there are 33,000 species of bony fish, and there, that includes 3,800 species of catfish alone. So there are three times as many species as ca of catfish in the world as all of the, the sharks and rays 
in the world, which is pretty crazy. So, so if I tell people to name a typical shark, just name a shark, usually the one that immediately jumps out is this thing, uh, the white shark. People call them a great white shark. You'll never hear me say that. It's a so-so white shark, kind of lazy, fat, you know, I don't have much use for them. But that is decidedly not a typical shark. Um, in fact, a typical shark is less than about three feet long because most species of sharks in the world don't get bigger than three feet long. And about half of them live their entire lives in the deep sea. Most people don't realize that, that half of the species diversity of sharks is in the deep sea. And we define the deep sea here as deeper than 200 meters. So you're talking about deeper than about 700 feet deep or so. And so really a typical shark is a three foot long or less brown shark that lives in the deep sea. So where do sharks live? So sharks live in all oceans, uh, all major oceans they live in. They live in uh, from the tropics to the Arctic. They go up to 100 miles up rivers, but half are found deeper than 700 feet deep. Uh, and so this diagram here shows the divisions of the depths of the oceans uh, from the shallow epipelagic zone that gets full sunlight down to the mesopelagic zone that gets twilight, which we'll talk about, and then on down to the, to the uh, areas with no light, the deeper parts of the ocean. So by way of comparison to a shark that lives its whole life 700 feet deep, the deepest free dive of any human, the world record, is right at about that depth is uh, just shallower, a little bit shallower than that, 600 and something feet, but that's the deepest free dive a human has ever made. The deepest scuba dive is just over 300 meters deep or almost a thousand, or in a thousand feet deep. Our deepest military submarines only go down to about 2,400 feet and, and they start, that gets to close to their crush depth. Now there are research submarines that can go a lot deeper than this, but the uh, military stuff, uh, don't. Um, but these sharks, we've got sharks that are essentially uh, basically distributed from about 700 feet deep down to almost 10,000 feet deep uh, in the world's oceans. So quite deep. I don't know why this is. Something's happening with my audio, but. Um, so, uh, uh, so down to about 10,000 feet deep, it's important to realize that, um, can you still hear me? Oops, hopefully. Um, it's important to realize that uh, there are actually no sharks when you get down to about 13,000 feet deep or so, what we call the abyss. Um, they're very, very, there are no sharks below that depth and there are actually relatively few bony fish when you get down to those depths as well. Um, so by comparison, this is a, a, a composite of all of the relatively common shallow water sharks in Florida. There's about 25 species of those. Uh, but by comparison, in our research, we've caught more than 30 species, actually about 35 species. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt one more time, Dean. Sorry, if you want to just turn your volume up just a little bit. I know there was that glitch. We've got that sorted. But um, yeah, if you want to just turn your volume up. This is as loud as I go. Okay. All right. That's something. But we'll just, we'll make it work then. I'm going to disappear better? again. All right. Is that's that great. Yep. That's good. All, All right. right. So by comparison, there are about 35 species of deep water sharks that we find in Florida waters. So, uh, so more species of deep sea sharks that we find off the coast of Florida than coastal and pelagic sharks. Um, so as I said, most uh, or at least half of the species of sharks in the world are found deeper than 700 feet deep. But surprisingly, only about 10% of the shark research in the world is done on those species, on those deep sea species. Um, and so it's wide open for, for research. So this is really where, uh, this is like the equivalent of space exploration for, you know, shark nerds like me. Uh, and so this is why I've really gotten into the deep sea world is because there aren't all that many people doing work in the deep sea world. Um, and this is also where many new species of, uh, of sharks are being discovered. Most of, a, a large proportion of the new shark species being discovered are in the deep sea. Um, now, this is Sharktopus. Some of you may have seen Sharktopus on, on uh, FX or whatever, Sci-Fi Channel, one of those things, this fanciful thing. Well, it may shock you to realize that actually 
Sharktopus was discovered and really exists in the deep sea right now. It's, it's swimming down there. It was discovered this year. Sharktopus is a real thing. Okay, no, it's not. Um, I could hardly uh, keep from laughing while I did that corny joke. It's April Fool's Day, guy. Come on, it's April April first. You got to expect a joke or two in here. So, Sharktopus does not fancy, does not exist. Obviously, it's a fake. But this is a newly described shark, one that we described uh, a couple years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a deep sea shark relative of the spiny dogfish. It's super cool. This guy's even cooler. This is the American pocket shark. I would argue that this thing is cooler than a shark ever could be. Awesome little shark. And we're going to talk more about this little deep sea American pocket shark uh, that was described uh, a couple years ago uh, in just a little bit. We'll get back to that. So within the deep sea, let's talk about the different groups of sharks that there are. Um, so they're, the first major group are the deep benthic species. So these are ones that don't migrate vertically up and down the slope or up and down in the water column, but instead basically stay on the bottom all the time. And so they're basically on the bottom from about 200 meters or 700 feet deep down to about 10,000 feet deep. Um, most of the species are in the shallower part of that depth zone, the mesopelagic zone. We call that the twilight zone because while there's not much light, there is a little bit of downwelling light. And as you get deeper, if you go from 700 feet down to 3,000 feet, it goes from uh, dim light to even dimmer light to almost no light once you get down to about 3,000 feet deep. And so this is where most of these animals are. And so most of these animals have really large eyes, these sharks do, to allow them to really harvest and be able to see in that very dim, uh, dim light at those depths. So it includes some crazy things like this is the Caribbean rough shark. We know almost nothing about this animal and it's found right, right off of uh, the coast of Florida. Crazy looking thing. Also includes things like the cat shark. This is a crazy one, right? Okay, so that's not a real cat shark, clearly. But this deep benthic group of sharks is dominated by cat sharks. This is a real cat shark. This is our most common cat shark off the coast of Florida. This is the chain cat shark. You see they can be incredibly abundant in certain areas. And they have fairly large eyes. These guys occur down to, oh, down to about, you know, uh, maybe a uh, maybe 1,500 feet deep or something like that. If you get to the below that mesopelagic zone, that twilight zone, you get into an area we call the midnight zone. That midnight zone, there's no eyes uh, or no light. There's no light. And because there are no light, uh, any of the sharks that live in this depth tend to have uh, smaller eyes and they tend to be dark black or brown in coloration. And so this includes uh, a lot of cat sharks as well, such as this is the Iceland cat shark. It's called the Iceland cat shark, but it's actually found it's very broadly distributed. They're in the Gulf of Mexico. They're off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic. Um, but that's what a typical really deep benthic shark would look like, kind of a floppy, slow-moving animal with relatively small eyes, and they're usually dark brown. Now the next group are the ones that we call the pelagic migrators. And so these are ones that actually migrate daily up and down the water column. Um, and so they basically are deeper during the day and they come shallow during the night. Um, and so they're primarily in that twilight zone, that mesopelagic zone where there's some dim downwelling light. Um, they have large eyes. Uh, and most are bioluminescent. That means they produce light. You may not know, everybody may not know that there are sharks that produce light. And so let's, let's talk about that for a second because that's called bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is the production of light by a critter, by an animal or, or even by a plant. And so it's basically the conversion of chemical energy, energy into light. Um, and it's incredibly efficient. It's very widespread in the open ocean. In fact, all of these little critters you see on the screen there, they all have bioluminescent species, species that produce light. Within the sharks, there are only two families that are known to produce light, the lantern sharks and the kite fin sharks. And so they have photophores on their belly that produce light. And you may ask, well, why would you produce light? You're a little tiny shark in the middle of the open ocean swimming around in the dark. Why would you want to produce light? Well, there's several reasons why you'd want to produce light. Uh, for one, it's counter illumination. So if there's a big predator swimming around in those deep ocean depths, 
and a fish swims over its head, that predator that lives there is really adapted for seeing very well in that dim light. So it's going to see a silhouette of something swimming over its head, just like you would if you were swimming at the beach and you went down to the bottom and somebody swam over your head. So what these animals that produce light do is produce light that has a similar color, similar wavelength to the very dim light that's coming down from above. And so that basically gives them camouflage by producing light to match the light that's coming down from above. Squid are fantastic at this, but sharks do it too. And so these are the photophores of a lantern shark, basically producing this blue light, blue-green light, which is the primary light color that gets to the deep sea. So that gives them camouflage, which is pretty awesome. Another reason to produce light is to basically identify yourself, identify your, the species, identify the sex and things like that. Uh, lanternfish like this critter here, they all have very, very specific photophore patterns or light organ patterns that tell uh, each of them which is the same species to make sure they're mating with the right species, hanging out with the right species. And sharks do the same thing. This lantern shark has very, very specific photophore patterns on the side of its body that are very different than uh, any other species. In fact, we use those photophore patterns to even identify um, species for um, uh, when we're describing them. Um, this is one of the coolest species to me. Uh, these these uh, midwater migrating bioluminescent uh, sharks are some of the smallest sharks on the planet. This is uh, the green lantern shark, one that we, uh, some that we caught in the Gulf of Mexico. This is probably one of the coolest things I've ever caught in my research. These are mature male and female, and they're only about a foot long for the female. The male is about 10 inches long. And this was the first pregnant one that's ever been observed. And these are her, her offspring. And you can see that they're ready to be born. Their bellies are covered in light organs and photophores and very specific patterns. And these things are only about three inches long. Can you, can you just imagine uh, how cool it would be to see a three inch long shark swimming around with, a, with lights all over its belly? I mean, what an amazing thing, right? Way cooler than a white shark, I think. Um, here's another really cool one, way cooler than sharktopus. This is the viper dogfish, which was only known from a couple of specimens until a couple of years ago when some were, when were caught on, in a Taiwanese trawler. But look at this thing. It's a lantern shark as well. It produces light, it, it uses counter-illumination, and it has these big dagger-shaped protrusible jaws with dagger-shaped teeth for grabbing uh, prey out of the water column. That's pretty cool. Another purpose for bioluminescence or producing light is to have a lure. So you basically lure in uh, prey. Everybody who saw Finding Nemo saw that on full display with the lantern, with the uh, angler fishes, where they, they basically attract potential prey to the lure on the end of this modified dorsal fin uh, ray. Well, sharks actually do that too, at least one species that we know of. This is a shark you've probably heard of. It's commonly called the cookie cutter shark. It's bioluminescent and it's one of the kite fin sharks and it produces um, a light to basically produce the camouflage, but it has this little collar and this collar has no light producing organs on it. And so the theory is that this collar actually creates a silhouette that attracts potential predators that think they're going to eat that thing uh, in the deep sea. But instead, if you know what cookie cutters do, they have this huge, crazy looking picket fence shaped teeth that they bite things with and they launch out and they bite larger prey than themselves. This is a swordfish we caught a couple months ago with a cookie cutter wound out of it. So imagine this swordfish is in the deep sea. It sees this little non light producing object in the water column. It swims over and tries to eat it. And all of a sudden it gets a big chunk taken out of it by a cookie cutter shark. Pretty awesome to think of. And then the fourth uh, uh, purpose of uh, having a, producing light, of having bioluminescence, is to confuse a predator. Some fishes and shrimp and things will flash their lights at a potential predator, hoping to, to startle the predator. Some shrimp and, uh, and also squids will actually squirt out a secretion that's, that produces light and that hoping that that big uh, cloud of light will allow them to escape 
um, just like the, the ink of a squid produces. Well, actually, there are sharks that do that too, which is amazing. Back to our really cool pocket shark. So this little pocket shark is, is been, it's only a few inches long and it's called a pocket shark, not because it'll fit in your pocket. It's called a pocket shark because it has this little pocket behind its, um, its pectoral fins. And this pocket produces a, a uh, substance that is bioluminescent, that produces light. So I have a little animation I'm gonna show you that uh, my colleague, Mark Grace, uh, who published those two papers there on the pocket shark that he produced showing his rendition, his artistic rendition of how he thinks this works. So they basically produce this cloud of bioluminescent fluid and it basically masks where the animal is and actually gives them camouflage and potentially could allow them to escape a predator. That's, that's pretty awesome right there. Okay, and then the final group um, are the bottom migrators. And so these are fishes that are sharks that primarily live on the bottom, not in the water column, but they still migrate daily. They still go deep during the day and they come shallow at night. Most of these things are doing that, and, you know, including all of those lantern sharks we talked about. They're doing that because there's a lot of prey to eat up at the right where the, the light starts to fade, because that's where most of your, your photosynthesis is taking place up in that mixed layer. And so if they get up there, there's a lot of, of animals that, um, that are feeding on the phytoplankton and things like that. So there's a lot of things for them to eat. They go up there at night because if they went up there during the day, they would eat, get eaten by shallower water predators. And then during the day, they go down deep to avoid, basically avoid predation. Um, so there are a bunch of sharks that do this vertical migration, but they do it on the bottom. And this includes a huge array of dogfishes and gulper sharks, and they're all animals that are usually between about a foot and a half and three feet long. They're dark brown. They have large eyes because they're trying to harvest that very dim downwelling light. Uh, in our surveys of, of deep water sharks in the Gulf of Mexico, and actually everywhere I've done deep water work, usually about 80% or more of the sharks we catch are, this, are in this group. They're these dogfishes and gulper sharks and their relatives. And this is what one uh, looks like. You see this one's off the bottom. This is uh, footage from a submarine we were doing work out of. And this is a Cuban dogfish, one of the most common uh, species in the, in the uh, Caribbean and off the Florida coast uh, as well. Um, but there are also some big predators that are in this group. So it's not, not all of the deep water sharks are small, most are, but there are actually some really large predators. This is actually a deep water a sleeper shark uh, that was filmed from a, uh, basically a remotely operated camera system that was on a sled on one of the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And they filmed this thing at about 9,000 feet deep. Uh, no one knew that the sleeper sharks even occurred there and no one had ever caught one, but we actually did catch one. And it was at about, ours was at about 6,000 feet deep. It was a Greenland shark. Um, it's about 13 feet long and it's still not mature. So this is a big, one of the big predators, one of the major predators in the deep, uh, in the deep ocean uh, is the Greenland shark. Um, so there are all kinds of new uh, things that can be discovered in the deep sea. This is where ours were, was caught, right near where the uh, deep water horizon oil spill uh, occurred. Um, but just like that, um, just recently, it was discovered that Megalodon still exists. A lot of people were thinking Megalodon doesn't exist. There's no way it's been extinct, right? It, it doesn't exist. It's in the deep sea. Uh, and so there's a video. You can go online and watch it. A video that Megalodon is still swimming in the deep sea. Okay, no, that's not true either. That's another really corny April Fool's joke. Uh, for you guys, this is, uh, um, you know, Meg has been extinct for about 2.6 million years. We are fully confident in that. Megalodon does not exist any longer. And this is actually a sleeper shark that's in this video that's, uh, that some claimed was Megalodon. So uh, another corny joke. Uh, you may also not know that some deep sea sharks have six eyes. Okay, this is the corniest of my jokes yet. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the last one, I promise. But um, uh, they do have six or seven gill slits, some of them. If you think of sharks around the world, 
of the 1,240 species of sharks and rays in the world, all of them have five gill slits, except for about 10 species. And most of those 10 species live in the deep sea. And so with my remaining time, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this critter here, which is the blunt nose six gill shark, which is one of the coolest species to me. I've been studying this, this animal for about 15 years now in, in various parts of the world. It's an awesome species. Uh, this is a little video of us um, tagging one with a satellite tag in the Gulf of Mexico uh, over the side of the boat. Um, this one's about 17 feet long. Um, around the world in the tropics and temperate latitudes, if you're, at, if you're at depths between about 700 feet and about 3,000 feet deep, this is the dominating predator, the, domi the major predatory shark. And like I say, they get huge. You can see uh, how big this one is. Notice they have really big green eyes and those green eyes are for basically harvesting that uh, downwelling, very, very dim light. And so we've been putting satellite tags on them to try to monitor their vertical movements and their migration patterns and things like and things like that. And I can tell you right now, this thing is way, way cooler than a megalodon. Uh, is the blind nose six-gill shark. In fact, this and these six-gill sharks were around 150 million years ago, 150 million years before megalodon. They've been around, around well over 200 million years. Uh, so this is. I think the coolest shark there is, and it's certainly way cooler than a white shark, uh, no doubt about that. But this is some of the data we get from them. So this is a plot basically from a male and a female over, those are days of the months there on the bottom, and then depth, and this is in meters. But basically the black is daytime, uh, is nighttime rather, and the red is daytime. And so basically you can see these animals make this very distinct vertical migration every day. As soon as the sun sets, they come up shallower. As soon as the sun um, uh, rises, they go deep. And they do that every single day over and over and over. It's really, really cool. Um, of course, most of what I just, you know, I just showed you was us, we have to bring the animals on the deck of a boat or up to the surface to tag them. But recently I've been really fortunate to get to try to do some work uh, tagging sharks at depth. Um, a lot of people use submarines for deep ocean research, but in general, all you can use it for from a shark standpoint, a submarine or a, a baited video or anything like that, we use all those tools. The only thing you can really get is observational, uh, where you can see, you estimate the size of the animal, the sex, but you can't really understand much about their biology or their behavior. Um, and so we've been trying to use a submersible to do this work in collaboration with Ocean X. And that's actually Edie Witter in the sub with me in that picture. Edie is, is, is the one that did a lot of the work on those cookie cutter sharks and some work on giant squids and all, all other kinds of other crazy, really cool work. But so my very first dive in a submarine, we convinced them to essentially, and that's supposed to be black here, we convinced them to let me, uh, if you can see on the front of this sub, there's two spear guns strapped to the front of it, and we got satellite tags on the front of it. They, can, they, they allowed us to put these spear guns on there, and we put up, sank a whole bunch of bait on the bottom, and we basically waited for sharks to come to that bait so that we could try to tag them by shooting them with a spear gun. We had a special tip on the gun so it wouldn't harm the shark, but it would allow us to put the tag on them. And so the very first time we were down there, we're down to 2,000 feet deep. I'm sitting there with Edie and the pilot, and we're sitting in the dark because we don't want the lights of the sub to, um, to basically disturb the shark. And so we, we waited until all of a sudden we noticed that there was silt everywhere in the pitch dark. And we quickly turned on the lights. And when we did, this is what we saw. As soon as we turned on the lights, a six gill shark was there and it's actually chewing on my spear gun. Obviously we couldn't, we couldn't shoot then uh, because we didn't want to injure the animal. We have a relatively narrow window in which we can uh, we can can uh, tag the animal. We don't want to obviously. You saw it, it pushed up against its belly right there. If we had fired the gun then, that would have uh, would have um, basically harmed the shark. Um, this is from in, a, a video from inside the submarine. Um, 
And uh, you can see it's swimming right over our head. Um, I don't have that big, crazy mountain man beard there anymore. Um, and so that's a male. You can see it's claspers there. And it's going to swim around and, uh, and, and come back. Um, and we have two lasers that are basically strapped to the spear gun. And we can use those lasers as an aim, aiming mechanism uh, to hopefully try to spear it, to try to uh, tag the animal. And you can see it swims right in front of the, of the spear guns. And, um, but the, if you notice those little lasers, they're still a little bit low. We were one, worried that on this trip that we would, we would damage the animal. And so this was the very first time I was ever in a submarine. Amazing experience. Uh, we tried this multiple times and we finally, on the very last trip, we actually did tag one from the submarine. Uh, but I'm gonna show you just a video clip of, of, of from that last dive um, and uh, with one of the biggest six skills, this may be the biggest six skill I've ever seen. Um, this is not the one that got tagged, but you can see it, it's eating our bait and it swam right around the sub. My colleague Gavin Naylor was in the sub uh, during this dive, I wasn't. Uh, but this animal is at least as big as those 17 footers I've tagged in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, possibly even even bigger than bigger than that. But so these are the biggest uh, of the deep sea predatory sharks in most of the of the world's oceans. And you can see this animal just sticks its big huge head right into the sub, and it was just pushing the sub around. We had multiple trips where it was just pushing the submarine around. Amazing! And you see a big green eye rolling back in its head. Um, what a cool, cool thing. And so if you're interested in this, this stuff, um, you, can, you can see more of, uh, of this video. All you have to do is if you just uh, Google, you know, six skill submarine or something, you'll get it. But it's, uh, there's a National Geographic documentary that you can watch online for free. Uh, I'm going to end it there so I have time for questions and and I'll just show you um, a couple more links that when this is posted online, you can go and find these links. There's a bunch of videos of documentaries that we've done on deep sea sharks that you can watch for free online. Um, and then one shameless plug before I go is that uh, my colleague Dan Abel and I have a book coming out on shark biology. And so if you're interested in sharks, pick up a copy of that. It'll be out soon. And with that, I will end it and say thank you for listening. Great. Well, okay, my video. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Um, I know personally, even though I've worked with a lot of sharks all over the world, I think the deep sea is is truly fascinating. There's just so much we don't know. And I think for all the students out there that are watching, if you're interested in this and grow up and decide you want to study sharks, uh, you might discover a new species because there are new species being discovered all the time, which is really exciting. And it also shows you how little we actually know about our oceans. It's not just shark species um, that are being discovered. So really exciting, an opportunity to truly be an explorer. Dean is actually uh, a modern day explorer, which is really, really cool uh, and very different than some of the other kind of approaches or techniques for studying sharks. So, all right, we have some really great questions. So um, a lot of people really liked your April Fool's jokes. So well played. Um, well played. Uh, Duncan jumped up to see the shark to us. <laughs> he was very excited. <laughs> uh, uh, so the first one are, are there any living relatives of Megalodon still around? Uh, so the closest really to uh, the living relatives of Megalodon are the Mako sharks. Um, a lot of people think that the, the white shark is, is its closest living relative. A lot of the images you'll see will have it it, um, it, it is as a big, big version of, of, the, of the white shark, but it, it's actually probably closer related to, to, the, uh, to the Makos. But Makos and white sharks are closely related anyway. So the, that group of Makos and white sharks are, are the only living relatives of the, of the Megalodon. Cool. Uh, let's see. We have Oliver, age nine, from Chicago, would like to know how deep is the deepest you've ever discovered? So maybe kind of which shark that you've worked with is, is found in the deepest part of the ocean? 
So the deepest, the deepest sharks that we've caught have been down at around 6,000 feet. And that's, those are th some of these cat sharks. There are also some deep water skates that we've caught. So relatives of stingrays that we've caught down to about 6,000 feet deep. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the deepest sharks um, that, have, that have ever been caught to my knowledge are at about 10,000 feet deep. And those also are pretty much, those are, are cat sharks and their relatives. Um, great. What is the most common deep sea shark, if there is one, or one that you've encountered? So that's a good question. So, uh, so around the world in the deep sea, there are all these, there, it, 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 there's always some species of um, dogfish relative, spiny dogfish relative, <clears throat> that tends to be the most common deep sea shark associated with the bottom. Um, and everywhere you go around the world, there might be a different species of it, but that's going to be your most common one. However, within the water column, there are some incredibly abundant um, uh, lantern sharks. And so it's probably one of the lantern sharks that's probably the most abundant deep sea shark in the world. There are areas where there are fisheries that catch thousands and thousands of those in deep water trawls. And so it's probably some of those small lantern sharks would be the most common deep sea sharks. How long do sharks live? This has been one that um, has been on here quite a bit. Uh, you could talk about sharks in general. I did type a few answers in, but maybe some of the deep sea sharks. Do we, do we even know how long these sharks live? So most, so most sharks, we don't know how long they can live. Most of our research is geared towards figuring out how long it takes for them to reach, you know, maturity, how long for them to grow up and, and how many babies they have and all that kind of thing. Um, there have been estimates of, of, of uh, how long some of them live. I, I actually had a slide in there from one of our students, um, um, Brian Moe, who's trying to figure out how long gulper sharks live in the Gulf of Mexico. And he has some that we think are over 75 years. Uh, so that's pretty old. There was a paper that came out that suggested Greenland sharks could live well over 100 years with an upper limit of 400 years. There's been controversy over really whether that's accurate or not, but it wouldn't surprise me if there are sharks, definitely if there are sharks in the deep sea that could live over a hundred years. Um, in contrast, though, I think some like our the these uh, um, lantern sharks and these small lantern sharks and dogfishes and things like that. Most of them probably don't live much longer than twenty years or something like that. So it's highly variable depending on which group you're talking about. Uh, we have one from Ryan, who is I know is just actually at the Shark Lab. Uh, he asked. How have we managed to distinguish that the six gill slash Greenland and sleeper sharks are actually different species? Has it been DNA comparisons or is it based more on visual ID? So we, so those groups, um, so to distinguish the sleeper sharks from the, from the um, Greenland shark, those, there's three giant species of sleeper sharks potentially. And that's actually somewhat controversial because they are really closely related and it's mostly genetics uh, that have been used to distinguish them as well as where they're found um, because they look so similar, uh, particularly the Pacific sleeper and the Greenland shark are really, really similar looking. Um, the six gill shark and the, and the Greenland shark though, those look very, very different. For, for one, Greenland sharks and the sleepers only have five gill slits and they have two dorsal fins. The uh, six gill sharks and seven gill sharks have one dorsal fin and they have six or seven gill slits. Um, so you can actually tra trace that division way back more than 200 million years ago between those two two groups. And if you then you start to look at their jaws, their teeth are very, very different between those groups. So there are actually a lot of really easy to distinguish features uh, between those groups if you have them close up to, to tell them apart. Cool. Um, how long was the biggest six gill shark that you've seen or caught? So the biggest we've caught is, is right at about 17 feet long in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there is claim that they may get up to 20 feet deep. 
or 20 feet long. Uh, but I, to my knowledge, none have been caught and accurately measured bigger than the one we caught, the 17 feet. That said, I think that one on that last video from the submarine, I think it was bigger, uh, but it, you know, with a big, huge body in front of the submarine, uh, we can't get an accurate measurement, but we are gonna actually use the, the distance between the lasers and we can actually get a pretty good idea of the length of its head. And from that, we'll be able to see you know, we get a rough idea how much how much bigger it was, but I think that one was probably bigger than 17 feet. Cool. And we'll just we'll finish up with a couple more. Um, do the sharks ever suffer ill effects from being on the deck? Um, I thought they often die after being caught and released. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to talk about the methods that you guys are using are designed specifically for these animals and, and what you're trying to do to kind of uh, reduce the stress on the animal. So this is so that's a good question, and so this in some ways is what started our research on deep sea sharks because there are a lot of fisheries from around the world that catch deep sea sharks, and everyone's heard of shark finning. Well, there's a similar process that my colleague Chip Cotton and I started calling shark livering because the livers are valuable, but the rest of the bodies often aren't, and so the liver could be har would be harvested and the rest of the animal thrown overboard. And the rationalization through the fishery was that the shark was going to die anyway. And so we decided to test that and see, do they die anyway? Um, or can they be released? And so that's what started our six gill shark work. And so with the six gills, that's one of the reasons we compared tagging them uh, in, by living, leaving them in the water to tagging them after bringing them on the deck of a ship like a, a commercial fishery would do. We also compared tagging them at night versus day and things like that. And we actually found they all survive. The six seal sharks are incredibly tough. However, a lot of these smaller species, uh, they do not survive. And so we actually did a study actually in the Bahamas to figure out what, how many of uh, the, the sharks that are um, the deep sea sharks that are caught will survive being released. And ones like the little Cuban dogfish that I showed swimming around, about 50% of them die after they're released. And they're a major, um, they're a major bycatch species in some of our fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico for grouper and snapper and things. And so 50% of those animals are dying. Um, gulper sharks is more like 80% of them die post release. So it's a big issue and one that we need to address when we're, when we're uh, managing fisheries. And this is also, you know, for us, there's certain questions we need the animal in our hand to be able to get the samples. And so we need dead animals at times. You can't tell how old it is unless you sacrifice the animal. You can't tell what its reproductive rate is unless you sacrifice the animal, unfortunately. But there are a lot of ecological questions that we have that we want live animals. And so so that's why we're exploring using things like baited cameras and submarines and things like that uh, to try to, to study these animals without bringing them all the way to the surface. Uh, what's your favorite shark? That's probably a tough one. No, it's an easy one. My favorite shark's the blind nose six gill shark. It's fantastic. I mean, come on. It's, I love, love those guys. It was for many years, my favorite shark was a short fin mako shark. That's what I wanted to study. You know, fastest shark in the ocean, all, all that stuff, till I saw the six gill. You know, you go back in the fossil record, it's the oldest of our living lineage of sharks. And so to me, the first time I caught one, it was like I had caught a dinosaur and got to get in the water with it and stuff. And so uh, I think they're just awesome. Cool. Um, do sharks have to pressurize like humans when migrating between the depths? So that's a good question. So most, most of, um, so the big difference between the bony fish that live in the deep sea and the sharks is that they live in the deep sea is the same as sharks and, and bony fish in the shallow zone. Most bony fish have a swim bladder, just like a buoyancy compensator you would use a BC if you're a scuba diver. And so they use that air bladder to regulate their buoyancy to go up and down the water column. Uh, sharks don't have a swim bladder. And so they don't have to worry about that change in pressure. However, there are some, some issues uh, from coming from high pressure to low pressure, uh, some, some issues with their liver and with some enzyme functions, some physiological issues. But 
overall, sharks can adapt to going up and down and migrating vertically in the water column much easier than most bony fish do because they don't have that swim bladder to worry about. Great. And we'll finish up with a couple more. This one is from Theo, age six. Uh, is the number of gills a shark has, or the number of gill slits, related to their environment? So that's a good question, Theo. Um, so partially, it probably is. Um, it seems that of the few species, it's basically a, a genetic duplication of the fifth gill arch uh, that makes up these extra gill slits. Most of the deep sea, most of the species that have more than six gill slits or more than five gill slits live in the deep ocean uh, where there's relatively low oxygen. So that could be an adaptation for being able to harvest more oxygen in the, in the, out of the water column. But that said, there are plenty of deep sea sharks that live down there with them for that have five gill slits. Um, and there's e there are even now a couple of shallow water species uh, of sharks. And, and there's a broad nosed seven gill shark that lives shallow, and has seven gill slits. Um, and there's just recently discovered two six gilled species of saw sharks that live, and one of them lives shallow. And so, um, and so that's not a, not a really good explanation of the oxygen one. So we really don't know why uh, these animals have more than six gill, more than five gill slits and why this has persisted so long, you know, while others have just settled on this five gill slit uh, regimen. That said, you, you know, the, one of the earliest shark, the, the earliest shark fossil that we have of a, what's clearly a shark was Cladosalac, which is about 425 million years ago. And we think it had six gill slits as well. So um, it may be sort of a, a, just this weird primitive holdover this, with this really small group. But I wish I knew why there are certain ones. And that's why I like them so much, because they're so weird. I'm just going to find... Oh. What are uh, the adaptations to the jaws and teeth of deep sea sharks? Oh, so many good questions. So there's a lot of variability in the tooth morphology of in the tooth shape of deep sea sharks, just like there is to coastal sharks too. So you see that they're sort of specialized for whatever they're feeding on. Um, those little dogfishes, um, they have like little knife blade shaped teeth in the upper and the lower jaw, which allows them to grab something like a squid or a small fish and just cut it in half. Um, many of those, um, uh, lantern sharks have pointed cuff teeth uh, on the top jaw, which allows them to basically grab small squid and things like that and shrimp out of the water column and swallow them whole. Um, and then if you look at our six gill shark, its teeth are shaped like a rooster's crest. It's like a little saw blade. And if you looked at the jaw, in fact, I've got, I don't know if you guys can see it, but if you can see this, this is the jaw of a six gill shark. And you can see the little rooster crest here and a small rooster crest up top. Also notice that this jaw is really weak. Compare that, for example, to uh, this bull shark, this thick jaw of a bull shark here that's really, really tough. This guy's real soft. And so what that does is this six gill will eat a lot of, it's a predator, but it will also scavenge on like whales that sink to the bottom, big fish that sink to the bottom. By having this weak jaw with these blade-like teeth, the whole jaw will bend across the body of a whale or whatever it might be, and they can use these teeth and just saw out a big chunk of flesh, uh, which is really, really cool adaptation. So, uh, and there are, um, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of other types of shapes of the teeth too. So, you know, and those like, for example, there's some, some um, hound sharks that are found in the deep sea and their teeth uh, don't have cusps at all. They're really adaptive for basically eating small crabs that they can crush. So, um, so the tooth, the tooth shape really is de uh, defined, is defined by what they're feeding on. And it can be really highly variable in deep sea, just like it can in the coastal, the coastal sharks. All right, and our last question is, do female sharks, female deep sea sharks, go to more shallow depth to give birth or lay their egg cases? 
Oh, so we don't know the answer to that question for most for most species. That's sort of the kind of thing we're we're trying to figure out. We do see some segregation between the sexes. Uh, for example, we see with both our gulper sharks and our our dogfish that um, the males are often shallower than the females. And so what we think is happening is the females go actually go slightly, slightly deeper to uh, give birth. They give live birth. And so they're going deeper to give live birth than, than they may come shallow to find another ma a mate after they've given birth. There is some evidence that for some of the cat sharks, which they lay eggs, there is evidence that, that some of those females do go shallower than where the males are. Uh, so they're going into basically warmer water to lay the eggs so that the uh, little developing shark in the egg case can develop faster with the, with the warmer water temperature. So it's, it's variable. And, and for most species, we don't have a clue yet. There's so many unanswered questions, but, uh, but in, in the ones that we've looked at, there definitely can be this, this different sexual segregation between, this, between them. Great, well, you guys, those, there's quite a few more, um, but we're gonna uh, let Dean get on his way. But thank you so much to everyone um, for joining us. Um, a lot of the questions you've asked as well, I'm just gonna do this really quickly. Um, hang on here, just a second. Um, I'm gonna do this really quickly. Oh, that's gonna echo. Um, Whoops, I need to close that down. I'm just gonna show you guys the website. So, because a lot of the questions you've had, um, if you go to our website, sharksforkids.com, um, you can kind of see it here. Um, have a scroll through, there's facts pages, stuff for kids, stuff for teachers. So uh, a lot of the information and some of the questions you asked, you can be found there. There's different activities as well, curriculum. So definitely check that out. Um, if you do have a question that didn't get answered, please um, feel free to, to reach out and, and to message us and let us know. But thank you again to everyone that joined. Stay tuned. We are uh, offering several more weeks of these webinars. And thank you so much, Dr. Grubbs, for uh, sharing all that amazing information uh, and spending a little time with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.